Where is the line? That's a question that we ask ourselves a lot on an individual level. Where is the line that distinguishes two similar things, yet vastly different things? Where's the line between being humorous and being obnoxious? Where's the line between being confident or arrogant? Where's the line between being helpful and just kind of being in the way? And sometimes it's a thin line that separates these two things. So we wrestle with this. We ask this a lot. And we ask this question culturally as well. It's not just an individual thing. In fact, some of our more significant cultural conversations involve this question, where's the line between what is right and what is wrong, what is illegal, what is legal, what is ought and what ought not be done? And of all the times that we as a culture have asked this question and had this conversation, few things have caused us to probe the depths of it quite as deeply as the Chevy El Camino. Ooh, I love it. What is it? Is it a car? Is it a truck? Where's the line, right? What is the essence of a car? Or what is, what, what is the substance of a truck? What makes one the other? And maybe more importantly, who draws that line? Is it the manufacturer? Or is it more like an experimental art piece where it's, it's really up to the consumer and the individual to decide which is which? Where's the line and who draws it? It's kind of a silly example, but it's a pretty poignant example of how we ask this question in big ways and small ways alike. It really is a common question, and it's the question that you and I are going to grapple with this morning as we continue this series we started last week called Judge Not. Sometimes Christians are accused of being judgmental people, or Christianity is called a judgmental religion. And sometimes, if we're honest, there's some merit to that. Shouldn't be, but sometimes there is. And so in this series, we're, we're learning how to grow in a posture of humility and graciousness while still calling sin what it is and opposing how it hurts people and the world at large. And that's a tall order. Sometimes it's a little messy trying to, to balance those two things. But that's what we're called to, and that's what we're trying to figure out how to do a little better. And today, we're wrestling with this question of the line. Where is the line, and who draws it? And to help us in that, we're going to be looking again at the book of Romans chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open those up, Romans chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along on the screen behind, or download the FCC Mammoth app to your mobile device, tap the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and you'll find our passage pulled up along with some notes to, to follow along with, take your own notes, get the most out of our time together. So our question, where is the line? If we were to ask that question of our world at large, we would discover that the line is, is kind of a fluid thing. What separates ought from ought not, right from wrong, one thing from the other? It shifts and it changes depending on cultural temperament, depending on the time frame that we're looking at. The line is a fluid thing because it's not really a fixed person or a fixed voice that establishes the line. It's really up to the individual. Culturally speaking, that's really where the authority of the line is found, is within me and my perspective. And the culture influences that to some extent, but at the end of the day, as our culture says, it's my truth. What's right for me may not be right for you, but it's right for me. i got to follow my heart, all those standard one-liners that we sometimes hear. It's an interesting worldview, and it's a very common worldview, and it is one that is fundamentally opposed to the biblical worldview, as we're going to find in our passage this morning. Scripture is consistent, and it's very clear that God's order defines the line. If you were with us last week, this is going to be a little bit of a recap, but if you missed last week's message, here's a brief summary of the important parts for our discussion today. Last week, Paul introduced us to the idea of sin and where it came from. It all started in the beginning. God revealed himself to mankind, and maybe not fully, but enough that we could look at the world around us and how it's put together and works and say, you know, there's, a, there's somebody out there. There's a God out there that deserves my worship for doing all of this. But instead of worshiping creator, mankind chose to worship creation. We worshiped images that looked like people and kings and, and animals and creatures. And that's a theme that continues. We still do that today to some extent. We worship created things, whether it be money or material things or positions of power or prestige, whatever. 
There are many things, aside from our Creator, that receive the best of our devotions. So this is something we can relate with and validate through our own experience. But what happens when we turn the universe on its head like that, worshiping creation instead of creator, is our understanding of the universe gets turned on its head. We understand ourselves in a skewed way, and we understand each other in a skewed way, and the way that the world works becomes a little discombobulated, and we begin to behave in some upside-down ways. That's what we call sin. And Paul talked about that in verse 24 specifically, saying the upside-down ways of sin led us to pursue things we ought not pursue. And God handed mankind over to pursue such things, not out of spite, but out of hopes they would realize the wickedness of it and turn back to him. The example is given is sexual immorality or impurity. Mankind pursued our lusts and our desires in a way that they ought not be pursued. So our conversation today continues that train of thought in verse 26. If you have your Bibles with you, once you open those up, Romans chapter 1 verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So the beginning of verse 26, because of this, lets us know this is part of a larger conversation. Because mankind turned everything on its head, because we pursued created things, essentially saying because we draw the line, not God. We pursued things that ought not be pursued, and this is epitomized in how men even pursued men, women even pursued women. Now, Romans chapter 1 is not a, a, a passage on homosexuality. It's not a passage on sexuality. As we said last week, this is an example of of a much larger and, frankly, a much more important point. There are three exchanges that take place in Romans chapter 1 that we read about. The first is in chapter verse 23. We read that they exchanged the, the glory of the immortal God for images that looked like mortal man. There's this exchange where here's what ought to be God's intention, God's order, and yet here's what we pursued. There's another exchange we read about in verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped created things. Again, here's the desire, the intention, and the order of God. Follow me in my word. And yet we exchange that for something that looked well in our own eyes. And then again in verse 26, we read another exchange, natural relations for unnatural ones. Here's God's desired order for his world, and here's what we pursued, something that looked good in our own eyes. And each one of these exchanges, what we see is our question at play. Where's the line and who draws it? And in every single one of them, we see that these exchanges, humanity answered, we draw the line. And as Paul's illustrated throughout this section of Romans, it leads to a continual perpetual spiral that ends in hurt and pain because that's what sin does. It hurts everything it touches. So that's the illustration of what's going on here. Like we said, this is not a chapter about homosexuality. That said, I can feel the tension in the room, and I'm sure you can too. This is something that touches on a sensitive subject in our culture today. And it's sensitive for a number of different reasons. It's sensitive because it is very opposite to what our culture largely promotes or, or teaches. It's sensitive for us maybe in a personal way because we know people and we love people to whom these verses speak. It may be sensitive to us because we ourselves experience same-sex attraction. And here we have this passage, and yet we have th this feeling within us, and, and the, the friction, the tension is there. What do I do with that? This is a sensitive subject. So while this, this passage is not about the topic of homosexuality, it is a very real tension that we experience between our faith and our world. So We'll touch on it briefly. I'll just be really honest with you. There are a few verses in the Bible I wish were not in there, just for entirely selfish reasons. Sometimes it's because it challenges my professional life and it makes my job difficult. This is one of those passages. This passage always leads to conversations that I never enjoy. But even more selfishly, I wish these weren't here because of my personal life. Like many of you, I have people in my life that I love and I care about that are in openly gay relationships. And I love them. And they're kind. 
and they're warm, and they're fun, and I enjoy being around them and their partners. I love these people, and we have had some awkward and uncomfortable conversations because of these verses. I don't enjoy those, and I wish that they weren't there so badly that about seven or eight years ago, I sat down on a personal project to really dig into verses 26 and 27 in the larger context, and to just kind of throw all my preconceived notions out the window and ask, what does this say and what does it mean? Because I was aware that there were other interpretations out there, some that dismissed these verses entirely, some that said, well, they don't really apply to our situation for this reason or that reason. And I wanted those to be true. So I looked at the cultural background, and I looked at the sexual practices of Roman people in the city of Rome and in the Roman Empire at large. And I looked at the practices of idolatry and temple prostitutes. And I looked at the, the, the practices of, of men with younger men and, and how that's sometimes attributed to that in sort of a predatory way. And I looked at the, the terms that are used here. You know, sometimes there's some ambiguity concerning these words because they're not used very often. And I looked at all of these, and I looked at the, the different theories, and as much as I wanted to believe them, I could not with intellectual integrity do so. Because, frankly, they, they don't really stand up to scrutiny very well. The culture of first century Rome was different from our world today. But not so different that it just is totally an alien world. The sexual practices of people were a little different in the dynamics. But not so different that it can't relate to our day and age. And the terms that are used here, there is some ambiguity in the words but not as much as some people want to read into it. No matter how you translate it, it all insinuates kind of the same thing. The fact is, these are not difficult verses to translate or interpret. They're difficult because they complicate our personal lives, and they complicate our relationships. And for that reason, I wish these weren't here. But they are here, and they're here for a very important reason. I don't know of a more powerful way to really bring this question into its sharpest possible focus. And it's not the question of sexuality, homosexuality, or whatever. It's the question of who draws the line. In every one of these exchanges that we've read, that has been the question. Who draws the line? Is it a mortal God or is it mortal man? I think it's interesting that when we read the biblical texts, this one in particular, it really doesn't call into question the emotions that people feel or the legitimacy of them. And it really doesn't call into question the attractions that people feel for people of the same sex or the legitimacy of those attractions. And it doesn't insinuate that people are confused or they just don't understand, which would be kind of condescending when you think about it. Because if you were angry, and somebody told you, you're not really angry, you just don't understand, or you're confused, you're probably just going to get more angry. Because people, generally speaking, have a pretty good understanding and grasp on how they're feeling inside. For those who experience same-sex attraction, all of these things are genuine and legitimate. What's interesting is that the text is disinterested in those metrics that our culture uses for truth. Instead, the only question that our text raises is who draws the line? Who has that role in our lives? And that question leads to many, many other questions for those who experience same-sex attraction. And I'm not going to attempt to answer any of those this morning. Not because they're unimportant. They're very important. They're very important for you on a very deeply personal level. They're very important to the God who made you and is not calloused to your need for love and companionship in the world. Those questions are maybe some of the most important questions you will ask and answer in your life. And for that reason, I'm not going to stand up here and give you some cookie-cutter catch-all answer in 30 seconds as if that's going to solve everything, because that's insulting. 
So instead, all I can do right now is just say there is an open invitation that if that is you and you want to walk through those questions with somebody, I'm more than happy to be that person, and that door is always open. So that's the abridged version, a very abridged version. But like I said, Romans 1 is not a chapter about sexuality or homosexuality. It has a much bigger and a much more significant point to make here. It is talking about the way that mankind has exchanged worship of the Creator for worship of created and the results that inevitably follow that. It creates a downward spiral that ends in pain. And Paul gives us more examples of this, by the way. It isn't limited to our sexual practices. Look at verse 28. He says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. We're talking about Gentiles in large here. So that they do what ought not be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Yeesh! This is one of those passages that when you finish reading it, it's like, why don't you tell me what you really think, right? It doesn't seem like he's holding back at all. This is a tirade against the Gentiles and their practices. And so when you read this, you're left with really just two conclusions by the end. Either people in the first century world were just awful, or Paul is one of the grumpiest judgmental people of the ancient world. So which one is it? Thankfully, it's neither, really. I mean, just like today, there were some people in the ancient world that were just the worst, that did check all of these boxes. But that wasn't the norm. Just like today, that's not the norm. But also like today, everybody has a little bit of sinfulness in their life. Everybody checks maybe one or two of these boxes. And as far as Paul being judgmental, that's not really the case either. He actually has a really important reason for why he's taking this very stern and frank tone. When you walk on a used car lot and you look at a car for, let's say, 45 seconds, inevitably the salesman is going to make his way over to you, right? Because this, he's like shark in the water. And when he gets to you, what kind of things do you expect him to say? Do you expect him to tell you everything that's wrong with the car? No. He's going to tell you every positive quality of that vehicle possible. He's going to tell you it's low mileage, it's got a clean title, he's going to tell you about all the, the trim, the package that's got power windows, power locks, you know, it's got the DVD player, whatever. He's even going to start laying it on extra thick. This baby, she got all four tires, right? And the brakes stop every time. Like, just really playing up this vehicle because he wants you to have this overwhelmingly positive view of this car. And that's sort of what Paul is doing, but in reverse, He is speaking to, almost certainly, the Jewish portion of the Church of Rome, people who are Jewish in their heritage and background. And he is laying out this tirade against the Gentiles as if to invoke every bad experience they ever had with the Gentiles, to look at all of the qualities of their culture that the Jews historically despised. Which, by the way, do you know the two things about Jewish culture, or the Gentile culture that Jewish people look down upon most sternly? It was their idolatry, which Paul talked about at length, and their sexual practices, which Paul talked about at length. There's a reason he focuses on those things, because he wants them foaming at the mouth, saying, you preach, Paul, say it. Those guys are the worst. Those dogs, oh, they get what they deserve. And that's when the trap is sprung. Look at chapter 2, verse 1, very next phrase. You, therefore... Have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. If you want to summarize it, we've got the expression, every time you point the finger at somebody, you've got three more pointing back. That's what Paul's saying. 
You see, the Jewish people of the first century, whether they were Christians or non-Christians, they had this tendency to look down on Jewish people, and because, or uh, Gentile people, rather, sorry. And because of their idolatry, the Jews saw the Gentile sin as somehow even worse and more despicable. While at the same time, because they enjoyed a special relationship with God, they looked at their own sins as somehow less bad or less awful. And in doing so, they started to create this sliding scale of severity. There's really, really bad sins, like what the Gentiles do. And then there's like sin that's just kind of bad, but it's not really bad, like what the Jews do. There's there's felony class sins and there's misdemeanor sins, right? And we're just going to create this whole big scheme and framework to give ourselves a pass, essentially, is what's happening. But there's, there's this really ironic thing happening here, too where the people who most loudly proclaimed, God defines the line, were themselves starting to draw lines and distinguish between what was really bad and what was kind of bad and what was a felony and what was a misdemeanor. They were putting on the robes and banging the gavel and being self-righteous, judgmental people. The Jews had learned this lesson really well that God's order defines the line. Where they stumbled was this idea that God doesn't measure sin on a sliding scale. Paul even insinuates as much. He says, at whatever point you judge and condemn them, you're actually condemning yourself because you do the same things. There's no scale, guys. There's no misdemeanor, or no felony and, and misdemeanor. There's no really, really bad sin and just kind of bad sin. It's just sin. It's all unrighteousness. It's all guilt before the Lord. The wages of all sin is death, regardless of what it is. It's kind of like Baskin Robbins in some way. There's 31 flavors of ice cream, right? Which, fun fact, there's actually like 1,400 different flavors. I learned that. Point is, there's all kinds of different variety. There's vanilla, there's chocolate, there's butterscotch ribbon, there's cookie dough, you name it. There's a different twist on it. But at the end of the day, it's all milk and sugar. All of it, regardless of what flavor or what twist you put on it, it's all just ice cream. And sin is the same way. Maybe you lie. Maybe you sleep around. Maybe you drink too much on the weekends. Maybe you put stuff through a needle in your body. Maybe you beat a man within an inch of his life. Or maybe you just got angry in traffic and called somebody a bad name. Pick your flavor. Pick the twist on it, whatever you want. Sin is sin is sin is sin is sin. It's all the same. There's no sliding scale. There's no felony or misdemeanor. There's no really, really bad sin. It's just kind of bad sin that we get to give ourselves a pass on. All of it is unrighteousness before God. And man, oh man, is there a lesson in there for us? Paul calls these these Jewish Christians out, and he holds up a mirror, and he says, yes, the Gentiles are unrighteous, but if you take a hard look in this mirror, you're going to find so are you. So who are you to condemn and to create such a a made-up judgment system? And church, there have been times where we've been guilty of the same things. I mean, it's, there's a reason, you might say, that sometimes Christianity gets a rap for being judgmental. It's because in 2,000 years, we still haven't learned this lesson that Paul is trying to teach. And we also sometimes implement this sliding scale as if some things are worse than other things. And maybe the most poignant example of this in recent years is the subject that we just got done talking about earlier. Romans chapter 1 is a big chapter. It's 38 verses. There's a lot of important and beautiful theology for us to learn and to be challenged by and to grow in in those 38 verses. And yet for decades, 30, 40, 50 years, the church historically has only really been focused or concerned with two of those verses, verses 26 and 27. Romans chapter 1, that's the chapter on homosexuality, right? Well, among many, many other things, yeah. Why is that? Why is, is, is there this historic obsession with two verses amongst 38? I mean, I, I've heard entire sermons and messages preached on why homosexuality is a sin. 
But you know what subject rarely gets that same level of attention? How straight Christians in their 30s and 40s in the dating world also need to abstain from sexual impurity. I've never heard a message in its entirety about how moving in together or cohabitating is sin before the Lord. And yet, for some reason, we're so focused on this. We teach our teenagers this lesson because we don't want our kids having sex. And we talk about homosexuality because we don't want those with same-sex attractions expressing their sexual desires. But if you're straight and in your 30s or 40s, yeah, you probably shouldn't do it, but, you know. It seems to be the attitude at times within the church at large. There's a sliding scale of severity here where one thing is seen as really, really bad and other things are just kind of bad. Or let's take a look at verse 28 through 32 again. There's lots of stuff listed in here. Universally bad. Murder. I think we're all on the same page with that. That's bad. They're called God-haters. That sounds really bad. They invent ways of doing evil. Also bad. They disobey their parents. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't seem so bad. Right? I mean, kids do it, and we don't like it. When we're adults, sometimes we dishonor our parents or we disrespect them, but, you know, when... It's not like it's the same thing as murder. And yet, what we see in these passages is not a descending scale of severity. It's just one big, awful clump of terrible, all lumped together. And gossip's in there too, by the way. I don't know if you saw that. Gossip actually is mentioned in the majority of Paul's letters as a vice and a sin to, to, to avoid or repent of. And yet, sometimes when we hear gossip, we know it's wrong, but we kind of shrug it off or we say, that's just how they are you know how people are going to be, and we kind of just sweep it under the rug a little bit. But homosexuality, mm -mm, that's too far. That's an abomination. That's crossing the line. But who drew that line? Where is the line between a felony class sin and a misdemeanor class sin? Where's the line between really, really bad sin and just kind of bad sin, or between unforgivable sin and easily forgettable sin? Where's that line? And the more important question, who is drawing it? Because it isn't the judge, church. Because God doesn't measure sin on a sliding scale. Sin is sin, is sin. And the wages of sin, as we read in Romans chapter 3, without any caveat or footnote, is death. There's a big problem here. And maybe sometimes the reason we are accused of being judgmental, if we're honest, is because we are. And we haven't taken a hard look in the mirror that Paul's trying to hold up in verse 1. We keep falling into this trap. So why do we do that? Why, why do we keep stumbling into this pit? I don't think anybody intends this in, in a malicious way. And yet we find ourselves stumbling. If we keep reading Romans, I think Paul gives us an answer. Sometimes we see some sins as too big. Because our understanding of God's grace is too small. Take a look at what he has to say in verse 2. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth, meaning he's an impartial judge. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? These first century Jewish Christians were very apt to point out the sins of, of the Gentiles and to condemn those actions. And essentially, Paul is asking, look, all sin is sin. It's all unrighteousness. So if they deserve condemnation, what does your sin deserve? Applause? Sin is sin is sin. And when we judge someone else, when we condemn them on this sliding scale of severity, we're setting ourselves up for a severe disappointment because that same question could be asked of us today. If their sin deserves condemnation, what does our sin deserve? Applause? Celebration? The really important truth to grasp here is maybe a little offensive to some of us, but something that our hearts have to wrestle with. If the grace of God 
is not big enough to cover over even the most heinous and egregious of sins. And it's not big enough to cover over any of sin. And you and I stand equally hosed and condemned before an impartial judge because there is no sliding scale. But praise God, there is this promise called the gospel. And it's a message about God and His grace that is bigger than what we can stand to comprehend sometimes. We get a real, excuse me, really great summary of it. The book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He, speaking of Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Listen to this. And not only ours but also for the sins of the whole world. I want you to imagine for a minute, we're just going to get real bummed out. I want you to think about the whole world and the sins that fill the whole world. There's a lot of abuse out there. And there's trafficking. There's violence. There's deceit and treachery. There are families that are torn apart by sin. There are cultures that implode because of sin. There are people that are devoured because of sin. There's some sick stuff out there. And yet what we read in the gospel is that the grace of God through the cross of Jesus is big enough to atone for all of it. There is no asterisk, footnote, caveat. If anyone regardless of any factor or any past or any offense, comes to him in faith and confession. Grace is theirs. The gospel is a really big, wide invitation because it talks about the grace of God that is really big, wide, and inviting to all. Or as John puts it, the whole world. Far be it from us to draw limits around his compassion and mercy. And if that's where our judgments lead us to, we do not understand very well who he is and what he's done. Or as Paul puts it in verse 4, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. In other words, that grace is not meant to puff us up with pride and self-righteousness and put a robe on us with a gavel and say, start drawing lines. Start drawing circles around God's grace and where the limits lie. That's that's contemptible. But rather, the grace of God is meant to humble us and to open our eyes to just how rich and how lavish His love really is. To elicit praise from our lips and rather than raising up a hand in judgment, to stretch out a hand in assistance and in prayer and in mercy. That's how we respond to God's grace in the gospel. Let us never be people that show contempt for the kindness and the richness of his love. Instead, let us trust his grace is always enough to cover our sins and the sins of anyone else, regardless of any factor who would come to him. That his mercy is enough to change us and to do the same in anybody's life that would come to him. Because that's the truth of who he is. And why he and he alone has the right to be the judge. 
Instead, let us revel in his grace and let us be humbled by his grace and let us imitate his grace and let us extend his grace and his mercy and his compassion regardless of where somebody may have fallen on this imaginary sliding scale of sinfulness. And instead of judgment being on our lips, church, let us be people who simply talk about the truth of God in the gospel. That in Christ, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world can be swallowed up in his victory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are kind to us. And you are patient and gracious. And we don't deserve a bit of it. But because of who you are, you extend to us this favor. And we praise you for it. And we are humbled by it. And as we prepare to engage with a world that doesn't really understand you, I pray that we would represent you faithfully. Not as the judge, that is your prerogative. But as the one who gives grace the one who is compassionate and loving and patient, the one who invites us to come and belong. Father, let us represent your mercy well. As in the name of Christ, we praise you and we pray these things. Amen.